the first year, I felt like was almost like autopilot. You know, I'm good at this mom thing. I love this. I wanted to be a mom forever, so I've got the mom thing. But it was like, now I'm mending four broken hearts. And how do I do that okay? Not just okay, but how do I, how do I make them properly grieve? Because I don't even know what that looks like. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Grief, death, and loss are an inevitable part of life, though knowing that doesn't make the pain any easier to bear. Whether you've faced unexpected loss time and time again, or are navigating grief for the very first time, the waves of difficulty can be drowning. But the good news is that God can offer us a life raft. Isaiah 57, 18 through 19 says, I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those far and near. This week's guests, Holly Singletary and Andy Griggs, share the holes left in their hearts and how God has helped heal them. And they share how we can find comfort in the legacies of loved ones past and also know deep in our hearts that one day we will see them again in heaven. First up, Holly Singletary, the wife of late country singer Daryl Singletary, reflects on their life together raising their young family, how she navigated his tragic death, and how her children have learned from his faith walk ahead of their wedding anniversary on September 16th. My name is Holly Singletary, mother of four, twin boys and two girls, stay-at-home mom, but just recently started a podcast and blog. And we live on a farm. I grew up in a really small town in South Georgia, uh, about 30, 45 minutes from Jacksonville, Florida. My whole family is there, mom, dad, I'm middle child, so I have an older sister, younger brother. Kind of your typical small town, you know, we, everything revolved around church and football. And then I moved away after college, moved to Atlanta and started working at Emory. And that's actually kind of moved me a little further to Nashville several years later. Daryl and I met, I just remember us, we kind of hit it off, um, but they were playing by the campfire and he was singing, I Let Her Lie. And I remember leaning over to my friend Kelly and I'm like, who sings that? And she's like, he does, Holly, he sings it. And I think I've obviously said it louder than I thought because it's everybody stops. And so I'm just like, you know, you know, like, okay. And um, laugh, everybody gets a good laugh. And still at that point, I just had, I didn't have a clue. I came home that weekend after meeting Daryl and told my mom and dad that I found the man I was gonna marry. Well, I always joke with him and say he could be the mayor because anywhere we would go, it just, he reminds me of like that old grandpa you just love that talks to everybody and you just want to talk to him. You know, that one you could just sit beside and hear stories. And so I would always say, you're like the mayor. Everywhere we go, you know someone or someone wants to talk to you. And funny, like so funny, witty, kind of a practical joker. But I think for us, we really hit it off with our the things we had in common, the way we grew up. His family is very close, and I'm very close to his family as well. And they sent him at 18 to Nashville because he wanted to sing. He knew from early on what he wanted to do. And even hearing his stories, and even his dad tell stories, he knew from like the age six or seven. And he really didn't waver from that. He loved Merle Haggard and George Jones from an early age, and so his dad said, Right away, he knew there was something different that he, he's like, we knew. You know, his mom said he would call on Sunday nights from the payphone over by the broken spoke on Trinity Lane and cry to come home. And they wouldn't let him come home because they knew what he wanted to do. We were married 10 years before we actually had children. And I think we both were just enjoying our careers so much. And he was a really great dad. He was hands-on. He changed diapers. He, he did the dirty work, too. So it was really sweet to watch because he, I think, I think our role of waiting so long prepared us for a different kind of parenting. I felt like we had a lot more patience and we appreciated some of the moments maybe 
that we would not have appreciated earlier on in life. You know, like touring never stopped for him. And a lot of times he would make it back home for Sunday morning and we would go to church. And that was our favorite day because dad came home on that day. And then for the kids, it was the day we would go to dinner after church. It was like it was a treat. But we just really, we worked really good together. We just kind of had a system and But there were times when, you know, we would be sad because Dad's leaving on Thursday and we're bummed, you know. But he would always say, but yeah, I get to be with you at home for four days. And a lot of dads don't get to do that. But he definitely took that role, that leadership of the man of the house and even in the spiritual sense. And really, that's what I'm talking about, because, you know, he would lead us in prayer. We would do devotionals together and that kind of spilled over into the kids as well. We really fit in there with that church and that group. We're still there, the kids and I still go. And they were really such a huge blessing to us when Daryl passed away. Talk about stepping up and stepping in and um, just very thankful to have that body to kind of carry you. We cry together sometimes. We tell stories a lot. And so for us, I feel like, I feel very blessed to have his music. And I saw that really early on with the kids. Like they have their little iPads and their iPads are connected to Daryl's phone. So all of Daryl's love for music, not just his songs, but all those old songs that he loved, you know, I catch them listening to. Or he's on YouTube a lot, so we'll pull up, especially the talking videos. Like we love those because he'll tell a story and we get to hear his voice. So we talk a lot about that and how blessed we are to still have that connection, like he's still here. He'll always be here, but those are really things I'm thankful for, that we still get to hear that voice and that music, and the kids really eat that up. I'm just real honest with them, and I feel like for us, that's really the best way, because I want them to feel like they can ask me anything. I don't want them to ever feel like, oh, I don't want to talk about Dad, because it may make you cry. And so I tell them, it's okay to cry. We have good and bad days, and some days we miss him more, especially on those special days or special moments or just an everyday moment. I'm like, it's okay to be sad. But one thing I tell them, it's not okay to stay there. I don't want you to stay there. I don't want that to turn into bitterness and anger and mad. And so I think we're kind of more, I guess, a cup half full, not half empty. And so that's where, you know, we, I guess, gratitude and um, a lot of that, I feel like, comes into place for us for the third year. Just now we're dealing and I don't like to say moving on, but we're moving forward. To learn more about Holly's story and her new podcast, Hope with Holly, please visit hopewithholly.com. Stay tuned to Andy Griggs' story after a brief message. Many of us want to develop a deeper prayer life. In this new 365-day devotional, Jesus Listens, Sarah Young offers daily prayers based on Scripture that will help you experience how intentional prayer can connect you to God and change your heart. Learn more about Jesus Listens and download a free sample at jesuscalling.com slash jesuslistens. Next up is musician Andy Griggs. Andy has suffered through a life full of crushing moments and devastating heartbreak, including the loss of his father to a brain tumor, his brother's passing from heart complications at a young age, and the death of one of his dear friends, Ollie's husband, Daryl. Picking up their baton, Andy jumped into the music industry feet first, longing to make a difference in the world and desperate to find healing in both the music and their legacies of faith. I'm Andy Griggs, and I make country music. I'm from North Louisiana, a town called Monroe, in West Monroe, Louisiana. But Nashville is my home. I've been here a long time. So I actually come from that that perfect red, white, and blue picnic family where nothing wrong exists. There are no problems. There is no sickness. There's no death, you know. I grew up as a small kid like that, you know, to where I'm just that all-American family where 
the world is perfect. You know, the first time that, you know, my world stopped, you know, we all have those moments where our worlds are just absolutely stop and it, it alters your life. You look back and of course it alters your life. I think I was nine years old when, when my daddy was actually leading song service in our church on a Sunday morning and just fell out on stage. Just absolutely fell out. And you know, of course, you know, everybody ran to him and he was sent to to, to the hospital and find out that afternoon, that Sunday afternoon, that he had a brain tumor. So all of a sudden, yeah, that's when your world starts changing a little bit. And he went through remission and went through yeah, heavy surgery, heavy radiation, but remission. Then for the next year, I, I, all I remember is going to different churches and, and him you know, sharing his testimony. And I'm not just talking about the state of Louisiana. I mean, we went all over Texas and Arkansas and Georgia and Mississippi, Alabama. Some parts of Tennessee, everybody wanted to hear his story. He was on death's door with this huge, massive brain tumor, and one day it was gone. Just one day it was, it was, it was gone. Um, so I remember for a year doing that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one day after about a year, year and a half, Daddy got a headache again. And... This time it was fast. I, re I remember uh, by now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 10 years old and I, I remember this look on my mama's face. And she said, all right, boys, let's go. Uh, your daddy wants us all to meet him at the doctor's office. So let's all go to the doctor's office. And I remember just this, this look on mama's face. And, and we went and sat down and, and we used the doctor's, the, the literal Dr. Greer's office for daddy to sit down and tell us. And he says, I, I want y'all to know I have it back and it's, it's bigger and stronger than ever before. This time it didn't, it didn't take long. So daddy dying was, was, you know, my first great big mountain to climb. You know, that's the story of my daddy. Uh, it's sweet, sweet, sweet memories. He was a great, great man. I still to this day have people come up to me and tell me how much they think of daddy and how, you know, man, the daddy still crosses their mind after all of that time. Now he died in 1983. So, I mean, that's, you know, time flies when you're talking about the loss of a loved one. Time flies. It really does. Legacies don't die. They don't die very easy. It takes a long time to see a legacy, to see the sunset of a legacy, yeah. Because the, uh, the everybody's life is a sunset. That's a beautiful thing at times. Life is a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing how God made this. It was me and Mama and Mason, my, my older brother. We just, you know, we, we tied our knots that, that much stronger. Leaned on God, didn't, didn't miss a beat with church. Matter of fact, leaned on church. All of our church family was so good to us and good for us, you know. But it's strange how a good family, uh, and you see, you, you see different families do different things. You see them scatter. You see them change for the worse. Sometimes you see them the close up. It's a natural tendency to do all of these things, but it's so warm to watch a family just go whop. And just those ties that the, the, those ties that will never be broken, you know. And, and that was my family, and I witnessed that with Daryl Singletary's family, you know. And that was the first thing that I just started praying over that whole family with Daryl was praying from my own experience. Let that, let that. The Bible calls it a hedge. Let that hedge become unbreakable, unpenetrable. And the more we hurt, the more we lean on each other, and the more that hedge the Bible calls is absolutely unpenetrable by the enemy. Man, I love that. I love that. And I think that's how the Holy Spirit moves, and that's how it's meant to be. It's our natural tendency to sometimes try to bear things by ourselves. But Jesus said, I'm sending the comforter. Man, I love that, the comforter. What does the comforter do? He ties those binds. He mourns with you, but he builds a, a hedge that is unbreakable. And I think that happened to me and my mom and my, and my brother. I think it, it is instilled into man that outside of our Heavenly Father and His sovereignty, the most powerful thing in this universe is 
my words and my prayer. I really believe that. I think prayer changes. It changes the future. It changes everything I'm looking at. It, it changes, uh, you know, man, when you speak things, and Jesus taught us how to speak, you know, and I don't mean pray into some God way out there somewhere, and we don't even really know where that God is or if it's going to be yes or no. And, you know, that's Jesus didn't teach that. Jesus didn't teach that kind of praying at all. Jesus taught you pray and pray like Paul. You pray hard and heavy, and you meditate. You know, you when 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 you when you hit when you hit that spot in prayer, you stay there, and the, let the Holy Spirit just move within your prayer. That's a lot easier said than done, but yeah, that's the way I was praying for Holly and the kids when Daryl died. And you know, the 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 irony of that is my daddy's name was Daryl when my daddy died. You know, families upon families, churches upon, upon churches of everywhere we had been given that testimony. Oh, my Lord, the prayer chain was big. And, you know, so we made it fine. It was a difficult time, but we made it fine. My brother growing up became more and more and more of my of inseparable friends. And at times I'll see that in sisters or in brothers. You don't see it often to where they're just absolutely inseparable. I know a couple of families like that, but not many. And that was my brother. He was my hero. He took the baton of my daddy's music. I didn't. I was more into hunting and fishing and sports. So my brother, he was the musician. He was the songwriter. He was the singer. As he became an older teenager, he formed a band called God's Country. It was a Christian country band. And actually came here to Nashville, recorded an album called Glory Road. And I sat on the sidelines and I watched my brother. Now, my, my brother was born with a heart condition, so he didn't grow up big and strong. My, my brother was real thin and a little short and, and weak. He couldn't go walk two miles with me out in the woods, that kind of a thing. But he was certainly, you know, my, if my daddy was Superman, I lost Superman, and all that kind of shifted over toward the way that I saw my, my older brother. My older brother became you know, the rock star of my life. So when I lost my brother, you know, that's not just a world change and that's a whole universe change. He died in December, so I was, it was my first year in college. I saw him several times that day and just like brothers, we argued that morning over something stupid, but it's, it's, it's strange. People ask me what got me into music. And it wasn't any kind of a dream at all. I've never had a musical dream. That wasn't me. I've never dreamed of Nashville or tour buses or singing on a stage or looking people in the eye, looking at crowds. My only way to grieve for my brother was through his songs. I picked up his guitar and learned how to play a D chord. His buddy Flipper taught me how to me how to play a G chord and a C chord, and I would sit up at nights. That was the only healing, healthy grieving that I could do was music, and it kept me up at nights. So as I was continuing to grieve and just playing Mason songs, and the Holy Spirit, you know, ministering to me through that, I didn't what I didn't realize. I was falling in love with music in, in, in a new way, in a new aspect. I was falling in love with music from the eyes of a quarterback, not from the eyes of somebody sitting on the sideline like I'd always loved. My life was changing before my eyes. It became to where I was miserable if I wasn't playing music. Before long, I learned a Merle Haggard tune. Hmm. Before long, I learned a George Jonestown, and it, and it started going that way. It never was a dream of me. I never had a dream of music. I was just trying to get over my brother's death. That's all I was trying to do. So, yeah, in 1995, I moved to Nashville and didn't know a soul outside of two guys. I didn't know a soul. Transferred my Sam's wholesale job to here. Just had a few demos here and there, but I was already talking to a record label and getting close to signing by the end of 97. So, I mean, that's that's pretty quick. We went in and recorded that album, and um, Brett Jones and I wrote You Will Never Be Lonely. 
that we decided that would be the first single. So we released it in December of 98 on Pearl Harbor Day. So I watched it become a number one, you know, right out of the box, number one hit by springtime. And I, I, I'm in that generation where I saw Nashville change. I saw music change. I saw produ- I saw the whole mentality change. The writing change. The dreams change. The pursuit change. The intent changed. Everything changed. Songwriting to me is it's it's a strawberry, but it's also a thorn in my shoe. Um, you know, if if the most aggravating thing is when you can't get something out, ah, oh, but how sweet it is when it does. Ah, oh, now that's rewarding. That's very rewarding. I first met Singletary right when I started. He was he was a step ahead of me. So when we first met, it was here in Nashville. And we respected each other singing. I remember he, I was talking about that. And so we would see each other here and there. And I, you know, I always thought Daryl had such a smooth, smooth, big voice. And having a friend in this industry that is a friend to be a friend. And I've got a million friends in music. And all of us artists, it's a small family. But we don't call each other and say, how you doing? You've been on my mind. That don't happen in this town. It don't happen. But Daryl and I were that way. I would um, confide in him and he would confide in me. As much as I miss Daryl's singing, of course I do. There's songs I still can't sing because I miss his harmony on it, but I miss his friendship because we did become that David and Jonathan spiritually. Iron sharpens iron. And I can honestly say that that out of my few spiritual brothers that I answer to, Daryl was one of them. He really was, and I was one of his. We would talk about tithing. We would talk about our problems. We would talk about our victories. We would talk about our valleys. We would sit down and pray together. Music didn't have nothing to do with that. I miss that because, again, that don't happen in this town. It's a very special friendship I had with Daryl. I have learned that when you grieve through spirit, there's a healing that takes place, and it's supernatural. It's godly, and it is, oh, it's just like stepping into a hot tub and just releasing everything, and not only are you made whole again, but you're bigger, you're better, and you're stronger because of the right way of grieving through the Holy Spirit. You don't, you don't just get through the valley with him. You reach the mountaintop with him and you scream hallelujah and you scream victory in a way that you never, never thought you would. I've seen people who have lost people that you think that would be the death of them and they get through it. They tread through it, through the Holy Spirit, through the comforter. I think that's such a great, great, great thing. That is, as, as as a true believer in Christ, I think that is one of our biggest assets in all of life. Is having that comforter with us and in us. Yeah. Helps me get through the valleys. Andy shares a passage from Jesus Calling, February 3rd, as he closes out our time with us today. I am with you and for you. You face nothing alone, nothing. When you feel anxious, know that you're focusing on the visible world and leaving me out of the picture. The remedy is simple. Fix your eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Verbalize your trust in me, the living one who sees you always. I will get you safely through this day and all your days, but you can find me only in the present. Each day is a precious gift from my Father. How ridiculous to grasp for future gifts when today is set before you. Receive today's gifts gratefully unwrapping it tenderly and delivering into its depths. As you savor this gift, you find me. To learn more about Andy Griggs and his music, please visit andygriggs.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about navigating grief, check out our interview with Eddie Montgomery. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with music artist Travis Tritt, who shares how God is in our past, present, and future. 
I got saved when I was six years old at a Christmas play that our church did. And it was so moving to me. It was something I always grew up with and always had as a foundation. And even though there were times when I strayed way away from it, it was always something that was in the back of my mind, in the back of my heart, even during those times. And every time that I ever had any kind of issues or worries or concerns or whatever it might be, I found that I could unload those things in prayer. And that really, really has been something that's been special to me throughout my entire life. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, on Facebook, and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.